Welcome, everybody. Uh, really glad to have you here. Uh, today, we're going to be interviewing Andy Culligan, CMO at Leadfeeder. Now, Leadfeeder is uh, an awesome application. We use it here at Stratabeat every single day. It's essential to our MarTech stack, uh, and I personally use it every single day. So I can attest to how awesome uh, the application is. Um, so what, what Leadfeeder does is uh, it turns anonymous website data and traffic into actionable data. Um, and uh, well, Andy can tell you much more about it, but uh, welcome, Andy. Thanks, man. Pretty great to be on. Oh, love to have you here. And uh, so, Andy, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and a little bit about Leafier? Okay. First, yeah, sure. No worries. Um, so, about myself. So, I uh, I'm Irish. Uh, I'm clearly not living in Ireland, though, as you can see, because I'm sitting outside in the middle of, or in the, st at the start of, or middle of August. In Ireland right now, I guess, it's raining. I live in Vienna, Austria, where it's now like 30-odd degrees. In US dollars, that's about 90-something degrees. So, um, hence why I'm sitting outside. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah, so I've, I've been in the MarTech space now, so six, seven, eight, maybe eight years or so. Uh, done many roles that are focused on lead generation, demand generation. Um, Prior to my roles at Leadfeeder, I worked for two other companies, which were uh, in the tech space, which is Amarsis, who are a marketing automation platform for retailers. And then also um, in the space, uh, the same space with a company called Exponia, where I was a VPN marketing there. So built up a global marketing team. Uh, we During the time I was there, I was we focused on sort of tripling, quadrupling the revenue size. So going from you That's know up to yeah it really really quad it almost quadrupled in terms of size from an ARR perspective but as a workforce perspective we scaled the company from sort of 80 employees up over 300 employees in the space of like 20 months so like the scale up business is where I really fit in best prior to that you know I've, I've done all types of roles um I'm uh, like it's funny I started working when I was 14 and started doing like, you know, terrible sales jobs and, <laughs> and working in grocery stores and I've done all types of odd jobs. But I, when my first real job was as an SDR, so like the, the one job that like uh, most people don't want to do, you know, so I, I, it's funny. I always say like, I've, I've only ever met, I've met a lot of SDRs. I've met hundreds of SDRs during my career. And I've only met two that actually wanted to be an SDR. <laughs> you know, so, so like it's the job where everybody's trying to, you know, uh, earn their stripes in order to get a sales role. Right. So I did the I did the thing where you get like you get the our boss at the time used to call it PFOs, and a PFO call is when you pick up the phone and somebody tells you nicely to please f off. So that's a PFO <laughs> call. So well rehearsed in that side of things. Um, and uh, yeah, so I did the SDR piece for a couple of years. I worked on in sales key account management for a couple of years. Then I also decided I, I had studied marketing. So I said, okay, I want to get back into the marketing side of things because although I enjoy sales, it, you know, it's been interesting. As I said, I worked in all types of jobs. So I sold cutlery. I have sold gym memberships on the street. i have you know, working <laughs> off commission only. Uh, I've worked selling in carnivals in South Carolina, would you believe? Myrtle Beach selling. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't quite go as far as being a fool to guesser, but you know, it was close. <laughs> but you have, I'm sure you have stories to tell. <laughs> I have a lot of stories to tell. Let's say, let's say they're probably best told offline. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, so my main focus is alignment between marketing and sales because I have that, that experience from, from the sales org. And also like I, I've, I've also managed under the marketing org, the SDR team. I did that at my previous company. I, I really understand the needs and the, the problems that an SDR or sales team face. And I try to get as close to them as possible. So with our CRO here at, at Leadfeeder who runs the sales org, myself and himself probably talk 10 times a day. You know, that's, and people ask me, how do you get aligned? I said, just communicate, 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 communicate. Yeah. Like they need to know what you're doing and you need to know what they're doing. And if, if, there's, if there's a lack of that communication, then you can forget about alignment. Yeah, you know? it's so important. Yeah, what you're saying is so critical. So many organizations, you know, sales and marketing, you know, they, they run in isolation from one another. They run silos and, uh, and you just see the disconnect all the time. And I tell you what happens with that. And I've experienced that in it, with a number of organizations is that mm -hmm. the salespeople come out and start creating their own messaging. And then the salespeople have it in their mind, oh, our marketing team are shit. 
Our market, ah, they don't know the product. They don't understand what, what we're seeing at the cold face when we're going and speaking with prospects and clients. They don't get it, you know, like, yeah, whatever about their blog post or whatever. So nobody's being <laughs> successful with Nobody's being successful with it. Right, right. Yeah. Marketing are churning out stuff that the sales team don't want to use. Sales team are super demotivated by the stuff that the marketing team are pushed out. Sales team are wasting their time coming up with their own messaging, which is probably not on brand. Right. Everybody's right. gone ahead and created their own stuff. And it just turns into a lot of wasted time and a lot of mo- a lot of demotivated employees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, agree. I agree. Yeah, so like that, that's my core focus. And then from a lead feeder perspective, like I've been with lead feeder now for since December of last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I, for me, it was like, it was almost like a no brainer. And I'll tell you why, because I, um, I've been working in the space where I've been selling or I've been in marketing to, to B2C marketers. So the last two organizations that I really earned my stripes in from a, a tech perspective that I spent all, almost over five years at in, in, in senior marketing positions was still communicating to B2C marketers, right? And lead feeder is a B2B tool. So I had always been a B2B marketer. I've never been a B2C marketer. I've, I've, done, I've dabbled in it, but I've never had the same problems that a B2C marketer faces yeah. because it, it, they're similar problems to a B2B marketer but it's not the same. You right, can't compare somebody that's exactly. If you've got a brand, let's say American apparel or something like that. And you've got somebody that's, that's their digital marketing manager or their head of marketing, your CMO or whatever. That person's problems that they're going to face in terms of what they need to be focused on on a daily basis, what their targets, KPIs, et cetera, are, are going to be fundamentally different to what mine are as a B2B CMO. Yeah. So I'm going to be focused, you know, not massive, like the difference would be that I would be focused on, okay, both of us would be focused on revenue, probably, but there would, the way in which we get to our revenue is going to be very different. So it's, you know, my message, I, I found it hard for my message to resonate with those marketers. Now it worked, but, and it's, it's impossible to, to, to find somebody from the B2C space and put them into the B2B space and expect them to do the same. I think it's the yeah. problem with, with that specific thing going from that B2B to B2C thing is that it, there is a bit of a like a, an area there that that doesn't really work um but now i'm after moving to a position where i fully get the pain point of the customer i've been the customer i've had the pain points like i fully understand why the tool needs to be used where it needs to fit in what specific use cases could be etc cetera, etc cetera. so like and with that even i can get my team based on my experience to be like okay this is how we should use lead feeder to do this this and this and like how did you like where'd you come up with that? Like and I was like, because I've you know been using tools like this. Yeah, that's and, great. You know, yeah. y- you have to learn like in order to get the most out of many, many tech tools, you, have, you need to know how to hack them. It's the same with any tool. Lead feeder is not not different. If you can hack it, then you can get massive value out of it. Yeah. Like out of box it offers value, but if you can really hack it and do some yeah. really interesting use cases, then it's uh you know, it's it's a super it's a super tool. And just to to touch on the point about what we actually do is we show the intent of the accounts that are coming and visiting your site. So um, look at look at the companies that are that are coming, what they're looking at, where they've come from, how long they've spent the site, how many people have come from that specific company, what their location is, et cetera, et cetera. So giving you like core intelligence, with, which a lot of companies would probably overlook, okay? Yes. So I call it like first-party intent data. You've probably heard of third-party intent data, which a lot of companies like Bombora, for example, would be doing demand base another one that would be looking at a lot of third-party intent data and third-party intent data basically is is looking at intent signals from across the internet so let's take for yeah, example yeah. you know somebody from microsoft has been searching for a marketing automation platform and that search query would then show up as as basically somebody from microsoft has been searching for marketing automation therefore marketo might be interested in that that's a super high level example there I'm not, yeah. I'm after doing that, like no justice whatsoever, but that's the difference. <laughs> that's, whereas first party data is the data that you own. So it's people coming to your website, interacting with your content, knowing your brand, knowing what you're about. And then what you can do is the more that people come back, the more you can score them. And then basically what we show is, Hey, these ones are shown particularly high intent because they've come and looked at the pricing page, which is a good intent, intent signal. They've also come and looked at 12 different blog posts. They've done X, Y, Z, you know, and then we show the company and the location and the, the number of people that have come. Right. And I think another advantage of the intent data that Leadfeeder brings 
is it's so timely. It's real time. I can see what they were doing this morning. I can see what they were doing yesterday and I can see exactly when they were doing it, how many of them were doing it, right? What each one was doing. It's just, it's so timely. You, you just can't beat it. Exactly. And if you're a salesperson and, and you're working an account, like a good use case is you're working an account that's maybe gone a little bit quiet, especially during these times. Um, people, you know, they, they're pushing out budgets. They don't want to make a decision um, and it's gone quiet. You can set up a, a, an automation or a notification to let you know when people from that account are coming back and visiting the website. Yeah. So you get an automated, autom- like, in, like in almost immediate, it's a couple of minutes delay, almost an immediate notification to say somebody from company XYZ has been coming and looking at the site. And then you can dig in and see what they're looking at. And that will reopen the conversation, you know? Yeah, and that's especially important for, for any B2B marketer that's doing ABM marketing. That's invaluable. For sure. Yeah, in ABM, there's a, there's a couple of interesting use cases. Like we've been, um, we use it ourselves um, within our ABM campaigns. So, if, so we have our total addressable market list already mapped out, okay? Um, and with that, what we've started to do is, is, is take the lead feeder data of anybody that's been visiting from specific companies to the site, um, extracting that information, and then pulling it into LinkedIn to retarget them. So we cross-reference it back to our total addressable market list, which we have already uploaded into, into Lead Feeder. And then it's doing a match when one of those companies comes to your site yep. um, from your total addressable market list. And then what we're able to do is then extract that information and to retarget them even further. You can push that across the sales team um, and get the sales team to also do a follow-up whilst at the same time retargeting from a marketing perspective. So it's a bit of a you know, double-edged sword there. Yeah, yeah, very effective, very effective. Now, um, so this is one use case. Can can you give us, you know, another really interesting use case of lead feeder that that you've seen among your customers? Sure. Sure. Um, So we've actually copied this one recently. We've taken it from one of our customers. Um, So (laughs) you learn a lot from your customers. It's one thing that I've asked my team a lot of recently is like, oh, when was the last time you spoke with a customer? Like, oh, I don't know, six, seven months ago. And I'm like, you should be speaking with a customer every two weeks. (laughs) Every two weeks right without a doubt you know well i don't know anybody i was like make friends with the customers like okay i know we can't be going bringing people out for drinks or stuff at the moment send them something to their house you know like do something like get to know them you know and i've really started to encourage that so things like this come out and we've started to copy what our customers are doing because it's super interesting so there's one specific use case that we've been doing on our uh competitor uh competitor ad campaigns so what we're doing is we've seen that anybody that clicks through on one of those competitive ad campaigns and converts from Google is um, more likely to turn into a paid customer than any other mm. of our sources or channels, right? Now, it's from in, in my opinion, it's, it's pretty clear why the reason behind that is, is because they're informed, they know the market, they've been doing their research, they know what they're looking for because they've been searching for specific competitors, okay? So... In layman's terms, they, they search for a competitor of ours. They end up on Google. We've, we've bid against their keyword. So competitor X, we're bidding on that keyword, competitor X, right? And then they end up clicking on our ad and they end up on our landing page rather than competitor X's landing page, okay? Yeah. Now, whatever the conversion rate on those pages is, you're getting a certain percentage of people that will then give you their details and sign up for a trial. And then you'll get like a big chunk of people that won't. Okay, like that's the same in any ad camp, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, but you're still paying for those clicks. You're still paying for people to click through on those ads and they're not cheap. Right. Um, so what we've started to do now is we've started to um look at those companies which are clicking through on those competitor ad campaigns and understanding what competitors they've been clicking through on. We've got that intel because we know that the keyword that they're searching for, that's pulled into lead feeder as well. So let's say we know it's let's say Stratabeat. Right. Mm-hmm. Stratabeat right. have come through. They've they've looked for a competitor of ours, let's say Lead Forensics. They search for Lead Forensics. And there's me giving a shout out to Lead Forensics here, like a bad CMO. Um and <laughs> <laughs> they've searched for Lead Forensics. What we can see then is in Lead Feeder, we can say, okay, somebody from Stratabeat has clicked on the on the ad campaign. Their keyword search was Lead Forensics. We know that anyway, because they've clicked on the Lead Forensics campaign, but they haven't actually filled out the form. We know where we know where they're based. They're based in Boston. Okay, we know the the type of user that we were that we were uh, pushing that type of ad to. 
So it was to a salesperson, marketing person, for example. Then what we can do is we can make a fairly good assessment, judgment, say, okay, let's follow up with these three or four people from Stratabeat after we do our research. Within the tool itself, there's also the contacts feature. With that as well, you can get some really good intel, intel like when you're following up and say, hey, Lead Feeder offers this feature, whereas Lead Forensics doesn't. Lead Feeder, Lead Feeder has these particular types of contracts in terms of pricing and what type of contract we want you to sign versus what Lead Forensics doesn't have. You know, and, and you're able to base your conversation there off of like what are the competitive battle points against your competitor, right? Yeah. Um, that's, that's one use case that, that works really well for our customer. We've just started it now and it's actually starting to, to, turn, up, to turn up some good business for us as well. So, and, and from something that we, it took two or three minutes to set up, like we were already doing the competitor ad campaigns. So like, why wouldn't we want to have that additional intel as well? Yeah, that's the thing, absolutely. like from, from our customer's perspective and from our perspective is like, you already have all of that data. You're just not looking at it and it's just yeah. not presented to you in a meaningful way. And all we're doing is taking it and showing it to you. Yeah, yeah, you've nailed it, yeah. Cool, cool, so uh, that's very cool. So I also want to talk about lead feeders marketing. So, so the marketing that you're doing yourself, because I'm very impressed with a lot of things you're doing. And one of the stories that you've told me is about the success of the webinars that, that you launched this year. And so I was wondering if you could, you could share with the audience just uh, you know, what, what you were doing and, and some of the successes that you experienced. Oh yeah, so I even shocked myself in terms of how good they were, to be honest with you. Like I'm still a little bit shocked, you know. <laughs> but you know, let's keep that between you and me, he said in his recording the video. But uh yeah, I think um look, it was it was really a, a right place at the right time with those uh and also like our guests. So like let's start at the start. Like at the start it really was right place, right time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it was like a bit, there was a bit of luck that played behind it. So let me tell you about how they started. So there's like, it's a pretty interesting story, right? So um, a buddy of mine, Alex Ollie, who's the, the CEO, or not the CEO, he's the, he's the co-founder of ReachDesk. ReachDesk are a direct mail company. I don't know if you've come across them, but they're, um, they're very big in Europe and they're, they're, they're making their entry into the US now. They've got a, they've got a presence there in New York. Um, but I was actually talking to Alex on the... I think it was like the 16th of March. Okay. Nah, no, the 14th of March. It was the 14th of March. It was a Saturday. <laughs> okay. It was a Saturday, right? Yeah. And <laughs> the fact that I know the date just got to show, you know, how much I've been thinking about this. Yeah. So yeah. I, you know, I, um, so we, we, we got chatting and I, we were just texting, you know, and I, I asked him how, how are reach desk getting on? It was so Trump just announced, I think on the Thursday, which was around the 12th, that they're going to be closing the borders mm -hmm. in the U S and uh, you know, that's when the world really started to panic. I think like we'd already, like we went into lockdown a week later mm -hmm. here in Vienna in Austria, or maybe actually a week beforehand, we went into lockdown actually. Okay. Um, and that's when around the U S started to go into lockdown. Um, but and I was talking to Alex and I said, look, um, how are things going to reach desk? And he said, Oh, you know, there's a little bit of fear, but you know, things are moving. I'm just in JFK at the moment trying to get the hell out of the U S I was like, Oh shit. Like, you know, you're in, you're in the U S you're trying to get, that's interesting. Like, yeah. <laughs> now I've got like a, a nine month old at home and I don't think my wife's going to be too impressed if I get stuck over here. And, uh, so I said, okay, well like we both just sort of came to it. Like, Hey, let's, let's take advantage of this a little bit. And like, you know, let's do some content. And, um, like I never shy from content. I'm always pushing stuff out. I'm like, I, I, I try to record as many conversations that I have with people. Maybe it will become a podcast. Maybe we'll push it out a video on LinkedIn, but like always trying to get as much content as possible because you never know what the gems are going to be. You know, Yeah. a lot of it's just going to be garbage, but like some of it, some of it really sticks. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, like we just, we, we had a chat then like we finished up that conversation on Saturday. Hey, let's chat on Monday. So Monday morning, he was back in the UK and we had a quick chat and we said, okay, well, let's, let's try a webinar. And I said, well, the key here is Alex that we need to get it like ASAP. And then he said, oh, well, how about Thursday? So yeah, okay, let's do Thursday. So we said Thursday evening. So we got a US audience as well. And then it came to the topic and I was like, okay, well, what's the, what's the number one fear for salespeople at the moment? And everybody was like, oh shit, like my pipeline is going to completely dry up. Sure. Yeah. Like, 
never mind what I already have in the pipeline, but trying to create new pipeline. Like we're coming up to the end of March now. How in the name of hell am I going to be able to create pipeline in Q2? Yeah. Like, like the whole world is shut down. Like what's going to happen? So we just said, we let's address that point, you know? And we, we, we call the topic, keep calm and create pipeline. We pushed out on Tuesday morning and by like Tuesday afternoon, we'd already had like 400. Yeah. And I was like, huh, okay, this is going in the right direction. Then by Thursday, by the time that we actually sat down and did it, we'd had like 800 registrations or something. That's great. That's Just great. from pushing out a couple of emails. Yeah. Pushing some stuff out in social. And like this whole thing, like it really helped everything. The, 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 the entire internal team dynamic, the sales team were like, this is amazing. You know, this is the best thing I've ever seen. And I was just like pumping out like messages to the sales team being like, you know, like, like explosions and being like, yeah, we're going to do it. Let's get another hundred on. And the sales team like, yeah, let's go do it. People like during a time where people were like really concerned and really worried, people were like, yeah, let's do it. It's going to be awesome. And then, you know, we had a, then on for, on for the webinar itself. I think we had like, I know it was 800 registrations. We nearly got 500 people on, you know, that's Which awesome. Is, That's amazing. Yeah. Like I remember that day, like, cause at the end of the day, you're speaking in front of 500 people. It just all worked. It just sort of followed in. It all just worked, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so we had that. And then I, straight after that, I was like, you know what? I called Johnny immediately afterwards. It was like 7 PM or something in the evening. And like, he was like, okay, great. Uh, like time for a beer now after the work over the past couple of days. I was like, Oh man, we need another one for next week, you know? <laughs> so and he's like, okay. Like to be fair to Johnny, he was like, okay, yeah, sounds sounds good. Like this is this makes sense to do. So so but he was he was fully behind it as well. So I said, okay, like let me look into my network to see who I can tap into to see who'd be interested. And a couple of weeks prior to that, Aaron Ross had been texting me saying, uh, I don't know if you know Aaron. Aaron is Aaron is the 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 uh, author of uh, Predictable Revenue. Okay. Um, which is basically like the sales Bible of Silicon Valley is what it's called. Um, and he was like the person that built up the SDR function at Salesforce. So brought them from like a 10 million to a hundred million dollar organization. Nice. So like Aaron's, Aaron's an interesting character, you know, Aaron's a good guy and we've been doing some business together over the years. And Aaron was looking to, to like piggyback on, on like other companies that were in the sales space, which were, you know, had a relatively large following that had high traffic volumes. Like we get nearly a hundred thousand users to the site a month. So he obviously heard about that and so on. So he'd reach out and said, Hey, I really like your content. We should do something. And that was a couple of weeks prior to that. And I'd done some business with Aaron in the, in the past and I'd met him a couple of times. I met him at a Saster Europe a couple of years ago and we just got chatting and we like, we just got along, you know, and yeah. he's, he's actually, he, I'd refer to him almost as a mate now, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, I just, I pinged them and I said, Hey man, like I, we did this webinar, it went really well. Like, do you want to come on like next week and we'll do one again. And uh, the topic was about SDRs, do's and don'ts. Um, uh, I think it was, we did a couple with Aaron and that registration got 2000 or that got that, that one got 2000 registrations in three days. That's awesome. <laughs> so it was not like, too bad, not too bad. <laughs> But I tell you what, though, we had so we had that was from the the Monday to the to the Thursday, and we had at the same time Thursday, you know, stick with a winning team, and uh, we uh, we launched that, and a thousand people tried to join at once, <laughs> and the whole service crashed. No, <laughs> no. Yes. Oh. Yes. yes. So, so, like, so what'd you do? It hasn't been without heartache. You know, like, so we, so I tell you what we had to do is, we, so what happened was the whole service crashed um, and a couple of things happened. It, it didn't work then properly for the entire session. Only about 200 people could get on. Um, and then what we needed to do is we rescheduled it. So we did it and then we did it again a week later or not even a week later. We did that on the Thursday and did it, did it again on the Tuesday. And then I had another one on the Thursday. Um, so we, we, uh, we, we pushed it again out to the same audience saying, Hey, we're going to redo it. Sorry about that. And I think we got a, still a thousand registrations for the second one. Yeah. That's still you know? amazing. Yeah. Um, so we, we reran it. Um, <laughs> we went through the process of changing our webinar provider. Uh, <laughs> that was a good move. <laughs> 
so yeah, we, uh, yeah, we did. <laughs> so yeah, it, as I said, it wasn't without some heartache. Like we, there was, you know, it, we were doing things so like by the, uh, like by the edge of our seat almost that it was bound, there was bound to be problems, right? Like there was no way that things were going to go that smoothly. Yeah. And it, it was, look, it's worked out so well. And we've, we've calmed it down now during the summer. But like what we started to see off the back of Aaron was like, because everyone's like, oh shit, you got Aaron Ross on. How'd you get him on? And it was just really from me knowing him from the past and him reaching out. And it was like a like a, a calamity of events that came together that just sort of enabled us to get that, right? Yeah, beautiful. And, yeah. and then other people just started hearing about it. And you see my posts on LinkedIn and then people yeah. are reaching out to me. But then I then it got to another level where I needed to be doing proper outreach to people like I was an SDR again. Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know, cold calling people, cold emailing people, cold message, LinkedIn messages, trying to go in through my network to other people, intros to people and so on. Like I was basically being an SDR, <laughs> spending half my week trying to get guests on. But it was super interesting, you know, like we've had, we've had some great guys on like uh, KD Dorsey. He was a great one. Like that was another one with, so KD and Daniel Disney, um, where they came on and, and, Again, it was like 2,000 people registering or registering. Amazing. And again, like 1,000 people on. And 1,000 people on, like 800 people stayed on like for an hour and 15 or an hour and 20 minutes. That's unheard of. That's amazing. And it was nothing to do with – so it turned into this, like it was nothing to do with the content that I was coming up with or pushing. It was a direction that I wanted to push. But the guys, like the guys were the ones that were really selling it. So like my point was like, Guys, like, I want you to just come and, and give value to the audience, you know? Let's focus on this topic. I'll give a bit of an intro, but then it's up to you guys. Like, this, take this as your stage. You preach yeah. your message, you know? Yeah. Um, and, like, people start asking, hey, you know, should we not put the lead feeder product in a little bit more, talk about lead feeder more? I said, no. Like, I think in this, in this case, I think the, the, the best pitch is no pitch at all. Yeah. Um, and we've managed to grow our database by like, I think we've managed out of those 11,000, there's something like eight or 9,000, which are net new. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. For free. We've only spent like a grand. We (laughs) spent a grand. That's insane. That's just insane. Yeah. So it's been, um, great. That's a great story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, really, really impressive what you've done with that. All right. So, so that's looking at what, what you've been successful with this year. Uh, just amazing, but but let's turn to the future. So, looking into the Andy Culligan crystal ball, what do you see? You know, for lead generation, for for B two B marketing, like what what are big changes that you might foresee over the coming year, the coming two years, coming three years? You know, you know just, what are some thoughts that you have? So yeah, I I think um, people need to stop with the top of funnel bullshit. To be honest. <laughs> Honestly, like I like uh, that's um, it, it's 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 uh, look. This is nothing new, but like the top of funnel stuff is real vanity stuff. People are seeing through that massively, you know. Like it, it, even look at the the changes and such that LinkedIn have made recently to their algorithm. It's to get rid of those like I can tr- like. 10 extra website traffic in two hours, you know, <laughs> to get rid of those like phony experts, yeah, you know, yeah. that have managed to get these large bases by basically just spreading bullshit, mm. you know, and I, I think that's going to start, start trickling down into content. And I think the content is where it's, where it's really going to be at in terms of adding value. Like whoever's going to be able to add the most amount of value and content without actually charging people for it is going to win. Like you're starting to see people do these like Patreon groups and so on to get like additional, to give additional insights and additional content. I think we're going to start seeing more of that. Yeah. And then eventually that stuff will start moving away from those Patreon groups and start like coming out into the real world, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And I think you're going to start seeing brands be a lot more fun and a lot more interesting. Like you're not going to have stuffy brands anymore. Like one brand that I'm really, really like, uh, excited about and really like uh interested in at the moment is gong mm-hmm. yeah uh, gong.io yeah. and i've been speaking with the guys at gong we're doing a webinar with them in september oh nice um, nice so like of course like you know you have to get them on so <laughs> i no but like they're taking things lighthearted. they they're offering real value in the content that they offer but mm-hmm. they're also making it super interesting you know like it's there's so much 
boring sales shit out there at the moment. I, like, it's boring. You're putting people to sleep, you know? Um, and I, I think it's really about adding value but keeping people excited as well because there's mm-hmm. such a, a massive amount of content that's come out in the past six months alone just because of yeah. COVID. Everybody started doubling down on their content approach. Yes. But, like, there needs to be a certain humor to the content. Like, the webinar things that I was telling you about that we were just talking about, like, I guess you've been on some of them, but they've all been quite lighthearted. There's no stuffiness. Yeah. Like people are taking the piss. There's like, there's like, you know, people are cursing on it, whatever, you know, like <laughs> people, it's, it's just fun, but yeah. it's turning, it's turning a situation or it's taking valuable, actionable advice and making it into something that people will listen to because it's interesting. And it's put out there in a fun way. Yeah. You know, like I've been speaking with a couple of guys about this this week um, because we've started, I've started to, in the background, started to record a podcast. Oh, yes. um, Haven't released it yet. Just this is, you're the first person in the outside world to find out about it. We've done, we've done a couple of episodes already, but it's really, all it is, is like us just like talking business, but at the same time in between, like trashing each other a little bit. (laughs) And, you know, like giving out about things here and there. But it's like, it's fun. You know, we're having fun. I don't know if it's going to work. Like I said to the guys, like, who knows if it's going to work, but let's push it out there. Because the last thing that people need is another stuffy sales podcast. Yeah. You know, this is the challenger sales methodology. And this is how you, ah, come on, nobody cares. Like, you know, there's too many people out there that are claiming to read all the business books and listen to all the business podcasts. I don't fully believe it. I think that's all, again, vanity showing off i think it's it's not it's it's not true and i think if you ask me what the next years are going to look like i think it's people going to be looking for truth and things yeah like wanting to see a little bit of the personality come in that's what i try to do on linkedin and that those Mm -hmm. posts tend to work pretty well for me when i just start calling bullshit on things (laughs) yeah you know like i i said that there was a recent one that i did where i said like I started the whole thing off being like, I got up at 4 a.m., made myself three cups of bulletproof coffee. <laughs> I then did, you know, yoga for an hour. And then I did Vedanta training, read half a book, read, wrote my diary for the next week, did all this. <laughs> and I said, like, actually what happened was I got up at 7, fed the, fed the dog, brought him out to the toilet, brought him for a walk, came home, fed the kids, started working. You know, like... <laughs> But that type of thing, that type of thing got up at four with the sunrise and I've been fasting for, for three days and, you know, and that's how you be successful. That whole thing is going to be, is it, it, it's going to be found out. It's starting to yeah. be found out that yeah. it's not true, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's whatever yeah. works for you. So yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's, if I was looking into a crystal ball, I think people are going to expect brands to be more real. Yeah. I think that's, that's spot on. And I remember that post that, that you uh, posted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, awesome. Awesome. Well, Andy, thanks so much for, uh, for joining me. Uh, it's been fantastic. Um, again, you know, I, I think the world of lead feeder, I, I think it's a, a fantastic solution. We use it every day. Uh, so, so before we sign off, can you just tell people where, where should they go? You know, where can they find out more about lead feeder or, or where can they connect with you? Sure. So um, people can go to leadfeeder.com. Uh, real simple. You can sign up for a free trial. So we do a two-week free trial. So you can't actually buy the product until you've seen some, you've seen some value out of it. So we, we, be, we fully believe that the, the, the best way in order for you to, in order for, to make sure that you're going to use the product is to start to see that initial value. Because we don't want to have customers on board that don't use the product because they're just going to churn. You know, yeah, yeah. why am I paying for this anyway? So we, we, uh, we encourage you to use the product for two weeks. Once you start seeing some value in there, then after that two weeks, you um, you can then upgrade, or you can stay you can stay in a free light version with very limited features. But um, yeah, you can sign up for the free trial at leadfeeder.com. Real simple. Uh, all you need to do is install a tracking script on the header of your site. It takes two minutes to install, and once you do that, we start, we already start tracking the, the the visitors to your site. Um, people can find me at LinkedIn. Like I'm very active on LinkedIn, so you can find me under Andy Culligan. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, anything at all, just reach out. Always happy to like, you know, shoot the breeze about marketing topics, sales topics, whatever it might be. So um, thanks again, everyone, for uh, for joining us. And uh, Andy, thanks so much for uh, for talking with me today. It's been really fantastic. Sure, no worries at all. Thanks, Tom.